section, or sessions, in fact, of the workshop. And I'm very pleased to uh, hand it over to Rosella, who's, who will be speaking about uh, something I mentioned before, uh, the mathematical abstraction, the way Alan Turing did for uh, the analysis of computation. So please, Rosella. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> yes, this is a very follow-up talk with respect to Eichel's one, because we are going to talk about the mathematical abstraction by seeing actually a case study, that is um, Turing's analysis of computation. But um, we start with the very general problem. The problem is that of modeling by using mathematical or logical tools, some real life problems or some intuitive or informal notions. And the idea is that these notions are imprecise or complicated. And in order to make them tradable from a mathematical point of view, we need somehow to simplify them. But on the other hand, we cannot oversimplify, because if it is true that all models are wrong, as the famous dictum goes, some models are wronger than others. That is, we can set a distance from, of the model from the starting problem. And the idea is that the, the, more distance is, the, the more distant is the model, and the less likely is to say something relevant about the starting problem. And this is the very general framework, and is, as you know, a, a very big issue. And we are going to deal with it by seeing a case study. That is the Turing analysis of computation. And the idea is that by seeing this example, uh, I will say something about the mathematical abstraction in general and about the rule of the agent, that is, uh, we can trigger a methodological lesson from this example uh, about the mo logical modeling of reasoning. But <clears throat> let's start with, um, by describing the informal notion that Turing aims to model, which is the follow mode algorithm, which is the notion of algorithm. And <clears throat> the idea is that everyday life is ab abounds with algorithmic tasks. And <clears throat> we may describe ro very roughly as follow by um, uh, saying that an algorithm is a method to perform a task. And <clears throat> we, can, um, we can see some relevant features that is, first of all, we have an input. In this case, we have shells, screws, and so on. We have a decide output, hopefully a bookcase in, in this example. And we have a list of rules to get from the input to the output. And these rules should be, um, of course, finite and should be determinate in the sense that we cannot have gaps and we cannot have overlap instructions because we, don't, we are not meant to be smart or to understand what you are doing. We are just to follow some rules. And that's why they should be very precise. And <clears throat> of course, real life is rich of um, algorithmic tasks such as make a coffee or make a phone call. But um, the notion of algorithm has a very central role, as you can imagine, in mathematics. And um, since the, the, the father of all algorithm is the algorithm described by Euclid in its element, which is an algorithm for computing the greatest common divisor given two numbers. And um, we have, as before, an input that are two numbers. And we have an output, which is the greatest common divisor. And we have um, an effective method to get the output starting from the input. And um, we don't need to understand to details how this algorithm work, um, works. But um, it is worth noting that at the very beginning of the history of mathematics, we have an idea of effective procedure. And moreover, we have an idea of solvable problem. That is, the problem of finding, given two numbers, the greatest common divisor is, is solvable in an effective way. That is, we can mm, describe uh, a list of rules that is an algorithm which is effective and can help us in computing the greatest common division. And, mm, you can imagine as this notion is, uh, has been uh, 
uh, sorry, as a prominent role through the history of mathematics. But interesting enough, we have to wait a very long period until circa 2,000 years later uh, to have a formal treatment of this notion. Uh, I mean, um, the notion of algorithm has been used through the history of mathematics, but uh, we have to wait many, many years uh, for having a formal treatment or a, an attempt to codify formally this notion. And <clears throat> interesting enough, even more interesting, during this period we have more than one attempt to codify these notions. And <clears throat> we have uh, four, actually, uh, different models on of the intuitive notion of algorithm of effectively solvable problem. And we are going to see into details Turing's one. So let's see in Turing's world how the problem can be put. Turing says, if one is given a puzzle, so a problem, a puzzle, or something to be solved, one will usually, if it proves to be difficult, ask the owner whether it can be done. Such a question should have a quite definite answer, yes or no, at any rate provided the rules describing what you are allowed to do are perfectly clear. Of course, the owner of the puzzle may not know the answer, and one might equally ask, how can one tell whether a puzzle is solvable? But this cannot be answered so straightforwardly. Uh, the problem, uh, the thing I want to underline is that now, it's now in this period, thanks to um, other well, contingent facts, histor historical facts about that period, which is a very interesting story, but I wouldn't really need that the problem is posed in such a way. We have to investigate the class of problems that can be effectively solved in its generality. And so um, we have seen with Euclid that we have this intuitive or informal notion at the very beginning of the history of mathematics, but now the problem is to investigate this class in general, in its generality, and hopefully to provide a formal or a mathematical model to capture it. And the paper in which Turing deals with, with this problem is uh, um, the one you see there on computable numbers. And I should say now that to compute a number means to, um, to be able to find its uh, um, digits. Uh, we have a, a real number with, his, um, you know, uh, with a number of digits. And uh, to compute a number means uh, at any desired depth to find that digit. For example, you can mm, think to Greek P and uh, the expansion of that number. And um, Turing deals with computable numbers, but uh, I will keep talking about solvable problem. And uh, by saying solvable problem, I mean uh, computable number or as well computable function, because this, these are very equivalent way to um, address the question, the issue. And the central idea in order to carry out a general treatment of the notion of algorithm and so the problem that can be solved in an effective way is the following. We may compare a man in the process of computing a real number to a machine. And this is the very central idea and we are going to see how it is developed by saying some um, extracts of uh, the text which I consider mm, very beautiful and clear. That's why mm, I think that it is worth reading. And mm, computing, ah, OK, I should say that uh, Turing called computer uh, what actually was a computer in his time, that is a man computing by using pencil and paper. And uh, of course, to think a computer as a machine would be at least anachronistic talking about Turing, if not impossible. You know. And so, uh, computing, um, Turing aim to, aims to analyze the notion, the human activity of computing. And it goes as follows. Computing is normally done by writing certain symbols on paper. And we may suppose this paper is divided into squares like a child's arithmetic book. 
In elementary arithmetic, the two-dimensional character of the paper is sometimes used, but such a use is always avoidable, and I think that it will be agreed that the two-dimensional character of paper is no essential of, com of computation, and I assume then that the computation is carried out on one-dimensional paper, it is on a tape divided into square. And <clears throat> the point is, it started by simplifi simplifying as, we, uh, as, I say, uh, as I said before, the, um, the act of computing a number. And it, may, it makes actually some abstraction hypothesis. I go through this and just let's see the abstraction hypothesis together it made in order to make the problem tradable from a mathematical point of view, as I said before. And it assumes that the support, which is actually the paper for the human being computing, it's one is one dimensional. And it assumes then that we have a finite number of printed symbols, that we have a finite number of observed symbols, because we can imagine the, the man computing which observes one symbol at a time. And it uh, Turing uh, argues that there is no loss of generality because if you want to observe more than one symbol, you can simply do it by, um, by two observations instead of one. And then we have a finite number of states of mind and um, moreover, all the performed operations are elementary ones, that is atomic. Um, the, um, a very important point is that any calculation step is determined, and it means univocally determined, only by the computer states of mind and observed symbols. We should imagine the man computing the number is observing one symbol at a at time, and it is in a precise state of mind. This is a very tricky way to say that he knows at which point of the computation we are. It is not a mental state, uh, uh, something like psychological activity, but um, you can imagine it is as a physical state. Just a man with his, a man or a person with a finger, point, the point in which he is at the computation. And the step, the following step is determined by the state of mind on the computer, or the human computer, and the observed symbol. There is an implicit, very important hypothesis, which is there are no practical limitations. We assume to have uh, infinite amounts of paper, of time, uh, or space, and something like that. Mm, so, after having simplified the problem in such a way by making this abstraction hypothesis, Turing shows that the human act of computing, if, um, oh, sorry. Sorry, I just have another question. Yeah. About the first hypothesis in the Yeah. Is that for practical reasons, for simplicity, or is that a necessary condition? Okay, uh, it is actually both. The point is we want to end up with a tape in order to, um, to, have a machine which computes on a tape, so one-dimensional and not b-dimensional. And it is shown that all you can do by using a two-dimensional paper uh, can be done in the mind how the, the real physical machine looks looks like in that period, in this period, that it was just an ad writing on a, a tape. And that's why the point is one-dimensional. Okay, that's... Okay. And um, so, uh, having made the problem simpler or clearer by this abstraction hypothesis, we can now show that this task can be performed by a machine and by setting the following correspondence. As I was, to, I was saying, the paper corresponds to a tape. The mental, state is, the mental states correspond to configurations or states of, of the machine. And the act of observing a square is substituted by the act 
of scanning a square on the tape. And we are ready now to see the mathematical definition of which now we call Turing machine, but Turing calls them logical computing machine or automatic machine. And we have a finite number of states. We have a finite number of symbols. And we have a tape which is not actually infinite, but can be extended in, in both directions. And we have an head which actually uh, is uh, uh, positioned on one square. Those are the actions that can be actually performed by the machine. It can change the symbol that just correspond to the act of man of uh, era erasing something, uh, writing something else. It can move to the right and can move to the left. There are two special operations of different kinds, that is to change state and hold. We have then a list of instructions that can be thought as um, a statement in conditional form. That is, um, we said um, we have to say the machine what to do and we have to be precise. Um, we say something like that, if you are in the state Q, QI, and you read the symbol as K, then do one of the following action. Write another symbol or move right or move left. And then go to the next state. That is to say, um, the following step in the computation is only determined by the state, the actual state of the machine, the symbol which is to be observed, and um, just these two, this couple of things determine what that is to be and what the next state is to be. And we can define the Turing machine as a finite list of such instructions. And we shall assume also that these instructions are coherent between them. That is, we cannot have, as I told before, overlapping instruction. That is, uh, two instructions cannot share the first two elements and differ for the third. So um, let's see uh, how a computation is getting. We have an input write, uh, written on the tape in some notation. Usually a binary code is used. And we just set the machine in motion. In motion. And we have calculation steps by um, the machine just simply follows the rules we have set in before. And then, um, if the machine holds, or um, we have an output written on the tape, there is a manipulation of the symbols on the tape, and we end up with an output. Or if the machine goes on forever, we have no output. This, it doesn't hold. And we can have now, we can define, formally define something before was informal or imprecise. That is the notion of solvability. What does it mean to solve a problem? And the answer in this framework is Turing solvable problems are those for which a Turing machine gives an output. And so we have now a formal notion of solvability. And <coughs> A very interesting point is that there are problems that cannot be solved by using a Turing machine, but moreover, there are um, problems that can be solved, but they, are, they cannot be solved in practice. Because uh, if you know the Turing machine is an ideal object, to the extent that we have, um, we have, we have assumed that we have no limitations of resources, and uh, so there might be a solvable problem that cannot be done in practice. And now we have, uh, okay, if you remember, we have uh, started by um, describing an informal notion of solvability. That is, we started by talking about problems that can be solved in an effective way. And this was an imprecise notion. Now we have a formal notion, which is Turing solvability. Uh, and we wonder in which relation these formal notions of solvable, Turing solvable, Turing unsolvable, and Turing unfeasible, uh, OK, problems, are with the um, informal notion of effectively solvable problems. And 
we have, first of all, a fact, which can be easily, easily observed, that all Turing solvable problems are solvable in, a, in an effective way. But we wonder whether the reverse holds as well, and Turing thinks and claims that this is the case. That is, logical computing machines can do anything that could be described as a rule of thumb or purely mechanical. And this is a very strong claim because we are meant that all, all solvable problems in, in the way we, are, we have described before are solvable by a Turing machine. And this is a, a very committing play, uh, claim, but there is a, a general agreement about the validity of this claim for at least two reasons. Uh, if you remember, uh, we, I said before, we have different models or uh, um, computations, uh, among which Turing is just one of them, Turing computability is just one of them. And the point is that all that models, which are very different from each other, they uh, have turned out to uh, pick out the same class of functions and to be equivalent between them. And this is a strong reason to, um, to accept the thesis. And moreover, we have that the thesis cannot be proved. And it cannot be proved because it involves an imprecise notion, which is the one of solvable problem, which cannot fit in a mathematical proof anyway. And we can see here, we have a Turing machine, which is a mathematical concept, and uh, mm, the notion of Turing solvability. On the other hand, we have an informal notion, the notion of algorithm and problem solva uh, solvable problem. And we have that in order to trade this notion, Turing formalized it by making some abstraction hypotheses. And the very interesting point here is that um, being this notion vague, informal, it is open to be modified by the formalization. And we have um, a positive feedback of the formalization to the notion we start with. And um, this is a very relevant point from a philosophical point of view, but from an epistemological point of view as well. And um, the thing we can note are, um, uh, let's see some of them. Okay, Turing is the essential aspects of computation. Distractions come from, it does not really matter the psychological activities but what it is important to characterize the act of computing is the observable behavior of the computer. That is the input-output behavior. And as a consequence, we have that the human nature of the computer is relevant. That is, whatever can be done by a man computing with pencil or paper can be done by a Turing machine. And that means that it is not essential for the notion of algorithm of computation that the computer is a human being. Moreover, if we um, accept, uh, this, is, this, this stands for chart Turing thesis, the, the one we see before, that is the, to, the concept, the formal concept of Turing solvability really capture is really adequate with respect to intuitive notion of effectively solvable problems. And the point is that if we accept, and we have, as I told before, evidence to do this, this thesis, the validity of this thesis, we have that the hypothesis we made in order to uh, to the informal problem do not change the nature of the intuitive concept we start with. And we can come back to um, the problem I state and, um, at the very beginning of my talk. The point is, um, when we aim to model an intuitive or imprecise notion, we need to simplify somehow. And uh, we made some abstraction hypothesis on this notion, and we end up with a mathematical model. 
The point is that this is a very peculiar case because we started with an informal notion, the one of algorithm, by uh, doing some abstraction hypothesis we end up with a model, a mathematical model, the Turing machine, and we see that this notion is maximally adequate to, ca to capture the starting problem to the extent that it, the class of problems that can be solved by Turing machine is claimed to coincide with the class of problems that can be solved in an intuitive or informal way. And in this case, I, I, was, I was saying that it is a very peculiar case because in this case, it seems to be that the mathematical abstraction we have done is costless. And uh, we can push on this by saying that we said before that all models are wrong, but in this case, it seems that the model is, okay, minimally wrong or not wrong at all because the formal notion turns out to coincide with the informal one. And this is possible, okay, the wrongness, we may, say as in, we may say that the wrongness of each model stands in the fact that this is a mathematical description. And so they do not coincide with the notion they aim, they aim to model. But in this case, we have that um, this positive, the positive feedback we have on the intuitive notion is that it is itself a mathematical concept. And when I started by saying the IKEA example, this was far from obvious. And that's why I claim that there is a feedback that is the intuitive notion is sharpened by the act of modeling. And, oh, okay, and this is a, a first point. The second one um, is the the feedback we can trigger on the rule of the agent in uh, modeling reasoning, uh, we concluded before by saying that the human nature of the agent is irrelevant. That is, the human being in this framework it is replaceable, we may say so, by the Turing machine. But um, we have to make a distinction between the act of modeling and the analogy. Uh, in this way, we when we want to build, by building a mathematical model for something, we have a target system in mind. But we can explain this model by using another informal notion. And in that case, this notion is not the one we aim to model. It's just, um, it is just an example to clarify what we are doing, but maybe it is more clear if uh, we see it in the Turing's case. Turing doesn't model the human being or the reasoning or something like that. He models the notion of algorithmic procedure. But he uses a person computing a number as analogy. And that's a, a very important distinction because when we build a model, through this, uh, through this analysis, it defines the notion of logical computing machine or Turing machine and Turing machine are, machines are abstract algorithmic procedures because that was the notion he aimed to model. But the interesting point, we ask what, uh, what, uh, whether this can be say something about the rule of the agent. And the answer is yes, because we can take in turn Turing machines to be agents again. And if Turing machines are taken to be agents, they should be an idealized agent because this kind of agents has no resource limitation in terms of time, in terms of memory. Uh, it has no limitations in terms of uh, computational power. It makes no mistakes and has no interactions with the environment. <clears throat> Most of all, if we accept chart Turing thesis, it turns out that this agent can solve any solvable problem, which is a very, very high idealization for the agent. And um, the point is that when we um, build a model, and now we are uh, modeling the agent reasoning, and uh, in doing this, we always 
understand at a normative level about the agent, and this analysis gives us the upper bound. That is the most demanding normative standard for rationality, because if we take agent as Turing machines, we have the upper bound uh, that which we can ask to an agent in terms of rationality. And uh, of course, uh, this hasn't to be taken as standard in uh, decision theory, something like that, but it is very usable, it's a valuable contribute to have the limit, the, the most we can do in terms of rationality. Um, that's all. Okay. That's, is, is this one? Yeah, thanks very much, Rosella. Is th there's time for, yeah, a couple of questions. I have a couple of questions. Probably it's just because I don't know anything about logic. And if you can go back to the slides where you define T solvable problem. In particular, I like a lot this analogy uh, with the machine and the person that computes. Yes. And I wanted to ask if uh, I can see a problem of bounded rationality in this language, like uh, I'm bounded rational and the unsolvable problem. You know, I don't know if uh, I was clear. In particular, uh, maybe, I don't know, I could interpret bounded rationality like uh, it's the unsolvable because I don't have the ability to compute something and T solvable but unfeasible as uh, I could compute something but I don't have the knowledge to compute it. And uh, so this is the first question. And the second question, it's relating about uh, your algorithm and the Turing machine, and in particular about the abstraction hypothesis and your feedback. And I wanted to ask if the abstraction has to satisfy some particular properties in order to have the feedback as you described. And um, as for the first question you asked, it is, I very agree with you, it, it, it is just the point I wanted to point out at last by saying that it is the most demanding, demanding standards for normativity, but if you want a, some, something like a bounded rationality, you can also have something like this by choosing uh, which kind of uh, idealization hypothesis you want to strap from, abstract from. This we have here a list, and the Turing machine is the, the maximum. We take all of them. Oh, that is, we ignore all kind of limitations. And as you said before, you can um, just make a step back in the idealization and have a rational agent that instead of knowing everything and be able to do everything, as something as some bounds, and you can put this. Uh, I, I mean, the absence, the totally absence of bounds here in this case is, of course, a consequence of the abstraction hypothesis about the tape, the symbols on the tape, and the steps as well. But the, that's exactly the point. To see this as the upper limit of uh, rationality of agent, and ca coming back to the second one, it turns out that in order to have a positive feedback, we have to, not to, in, by using a metaphor, not to get too far in modeling, because we have, of course, to simplify, but we cannot oversimplify, so otherwise we uh, end up with a model that actually doesn't say nothing about the problem we start with. And this is a very peculiar case because the abstraction hypotheses are very, um, I don't, some say, are intuitively justifiable to the extent that we see that all the there is no loss of generality in doing that, or it, is, it would uh, be unreasonable to assume something different. For example, we have that the operations are atomic ones, and that, that is no loss of generality to the extent that you can think uh, mm, more complex operation as made up by elementary ones. And so, of course, the abstraction is, hypotheses are very, very central in this, uh, in order to be able to have such a feedback. 
But in general, I think the necessary condition to have a feedback is in a way to uh, not get too far in the simplification. And this is a very peculiar case because in a way the distance collapses and the model turns out to be maximally adequate to the informal notions we have. Maybe a quick question from Pietro. Yeah, it's not clear if you already answered in part to my question, but uh, clearly the 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 church touring thesis gives an, uh, a very interesting insight concerning what is computable. Uh, do you, can, can you give us a very, let's say, <laughs> one sentence message of uh, does the study of complexity, so effectiveness more or less, uh, uh, generalize to lambda calculus or other uh, formulations, or is the Turing machine better than others okay. to talk about not just feasibility? Okay, in a very one sentence, no. Uh, they, are, they turn out to be e equivalent from a mathematical point of view. I mean, these models are very different from each other from an intentional point of view, lambda calculus and so on, but they turn out to pick out the very same set of functions, which is the Turing computable one. Okay, the one difference, if we want to push the question, is that Turing computability but some, um, something like an intuitive appeal with respect to the other. And that's why, for example, Gödel, he was not convinced about the, Turing, the chart Turing thesis and uh, this was formulated for lambda calculus or for uh, recursive function, but he was convinced actually when he was formulated about Turing computability because it looks more natural than other, but from a mathematical point of view they are actually the same. Okay, so that's the perfect time then to stop. And let's thank Lucella again. Thank you.